The Antiques Roadshow is a place where forgotten items of the world get to find their shine. During the Cultural Revolution in China, this watch was confiscated, and by the time it was returned, some pearls had been removed. The watch belonged to the guest grandfather and was passed down the family. In the early 19th century, a company in Switzerland made watches of this kind specifically for the Chinese market. On the front of the watch was a scenery from Greek mythology known as Cupid's Forge, and on the back was a beautiful floral design surrounded with pearls. The guest watch was a type which was highly demanded by collectors. It's quite a nice watch, and um, you should be very happy that it survived, and I'm delighted to hear the story of the watch. For value, the appraiser said, We think that if you had to insure it, you should think in terms of thirty-five, perhaps to $40,000. And later on, the watch doubled in value to $80,000. Because of his close relationship with the astronauts, he was timid to ask for their autograph. This man worked on NASA's Apollo 1 mission, and because of his role in the project, his superior made sure he got one of the photographs that were taken. The guest later summoned the courage and began asking the astronauts for their autograph. So when we were there testing and when that slow time, I just go grab a photograph and they'd autograph it for me. Neil Armstrong, Gus Grissom, and Edward White were among the astronauts that autographed photos for the guest. The popularity of Neil Armstrong and the tragic incident that led to the death of Edward White and Gus Grissom made the photographs really special. So just these two pictures alone? Yeah. Another eight to $11,000 <laughs> at auction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In an auction that was held after the death of the American artist Liberace, this mirror was purchased for $200. Years later, because of a downsize in apartment, the buyer decided to sell it to the guest who developed an interest in it. The mirror was previously hanging on the wall of Liberace's home in Palm Springs. It was engraved with the name of the artist, and its extravagance provides proof of its authenticity. Liberace's items surged a lot of interest after the release of the HBO film that was based on his life. I wouldn't be surprised if it did higher than that. Costumes okay. from that have sold for $6,000 from the HBO special, oh, wow. and that's nothing directly connected to Liberace. Sure. Speaking of the charming mirror's value, I think because this one is just so over the top, I would estimate it at auction around three to five thousand. Oh, great! Oh, well, that's awesome. That's awesome. In the early years of her daughter's childhood, they lived in the same state as Dr. Seuss. This was to her advantage because she was able to get her daughter's books autographed by the author. All three books were first editions, and they included "Oh Say Can You See," "The Five Hundred Hats of Bartholomew Cubbins," and. The Seven Lady Godivas. The Seven Lady Godivas, we have an ephemeral piece of paper that was issued with the book when it was first published. And there's not very many of those in existence anymore, and that adds to its value. Dr. Seuss was a celebrated children's book author and illustrator with over 60 books written. The autograph on the books and the fact that they were all first editions gave them a value of three to $5,000. Oh my goodness, that's considerably more than I would have thought, considerably more than I paid. Her grandfather, who was a clock repairman, so he gifted her mother this clock, which she later inherited. The clock was an 80-day French china piece with enamel dial made around the 20th century. On the side of it was a lovely gold work, whereas the front was designed with a painting, both of which took a lot of time to do. Unusually, the painter of the clock was allowed to sign their name on the clock. Which is really cool. They allowed that person to get recognition for their hours of work. A clock of this fine quality received an unexpected value of $1,200 to $1,500. Nice. We like that. Perhaps people aren't really fascinated by clocks anymore. The last time the appraiser saw a complete tea set of this kind was in 1978. And in 1991, he saw it again on the road show. Uh, so to see another one turn up here, I think is so exciting. For 60 years, the woman has had this tea set that was bought by her parents back in the day for 50 pounds. 
The tea set was Maholica ware, made by Minton in the 19th century. Minton was the leading maker of ceramics in Europe during the Victorian era and were in operation from 1793 to 1968. The guest items took the shape of various things, like nuts, squash, artichoke, and lily pads. I love the way it's been designed. It's been very cleverly thought out. Value for the tea set was between 25 to 3,500 pounds. Really? Really. While on a weekend trip to London, the guests saw this chest in an antique shop, but unfortunately couldn't afford to buy it. On getting home, he called back the shop and asked them to reserve the chest for him. Will this decision pay off? The chest was made during the 17th century and was used in many households to store clothing. Using a half-round chisel, ruler, and compass, the chest design was carved out skillfully. But it was extremely well put together and well balanced. Yes. And it was precise. The owner's impulsive buying decision did pay off a little with the chest new value. This year, uh, you could expect to get 1250 to 1400 pounds for it, quite hopefully. An American artist, Roy Lichtenstein, who was the mastermind behind this creative piece, was a key figure in the pop art movement. This piece was a screen print that was owned by the guest late partner who bought the art for $80 from a client turned friend. Roy Lichtenstein made and self-published the screen print in 1966 as an edition print totaling 70 in number. Because the whereabout of most is unknown, the guess is that only a few of these screen prints were able to survive. Given its rarity, it valued at... For around $20,000. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's incredible. I had no idea. An album documenting the construction of the famous Bay Bridge in San Francisco served as a lovely time capsule, giving people a look at what the bridge once looked like. The construction of the 7,180-meter Bay Bridge spanned from 1933 to 1936. Being a retired construction worker, the guest father was fascinated by the bridge, and so he couldn't help but purchase the album at an estate sale. Inside the album were photos taken from various angles of the bridge and short notes written by the photographer. It's not very often that you see albums like this about the construction of a bridge from this point of view. The value for the album was... I don't see any reason why it wouldn't sell within an estimate of 400 to $600. Oh, very nice. The weaving technique and the design of this basket is sure to attract anyone to it. Made around the 20th century by the Native American Kawila people, this basket takes the design of a diamond rattlesnake. The Kawilas made use of materials found in the deserts they lived to make their baskets. The tucked stitches outside the guest basket was the sign needed to know that it was a mission basket. So it sounds like it's a uh, very local basket. <laughs> a value of $1,500 was placed on the basket. Fantastic. On the way to buy eggs, a painting that caught the attention of the owner made him stop at the garage sale to let them know that he'd be back for it. Unfortunately, his wife felt it was ugly, so it never made it to the wall of their home. It was an oil painting done in 1976 by a Mexican painter, Domingo Ayua, who was crowned the father of Chicano art by the California State Assembly. Also, as an artist, he was influenced by Los Muralistas. The painting brought to the show was a depiction of the celebratory mood of farmers and their family, making it differ from his usual sad paintings of oppression. From being a $15 purchase, the painting's value soared to three to $5,000. Very nice. His neighbor, who offered to sell this map to him for $50, might have regretted his actions once he saw its value on the roadshow. He had purchased this map from an auction and didn't want it hanging on the wall of his sitting room anymore because it was too big. Luckily for the guest, he was able to buy it off his hands. The map was made in 1915 for the railroad by an American technology company, Rand McNally. It, there wouldn't have been that many printed 
it's probably a company issue frame and it, there's no fading or any kind of condition problems as far as I can see. For something that was made in 1915, it was in pretty excellent condition and given a value of $1,000 to $1,500. Okay, I'm tickled with that. <laughs> Which is more intriguing, the fact that this was done by the guest's seventh great-grandmother or the fact that it was done by an eight-year-old? The item was an American sampler, an item so rare that the appraiser revealed to have not seen one in his 23 years of business. This is unbelievably rare. Samplers were used back in the day to showcase the needlework abilities of people. Then it says this sampler was made in the eighth year of my age, Deliverance Clark, 1685. In America, samplers were at their peak from the 1820s to 1840s. Although the sampler was an extremely rare one, the needlework wasn't very different from most English samplers that were in abundance in the marketplace. The design's lack of uniqueness made it value in the range of $10,000 to $25,000. Even though the original color of this poster was faded, it was what people preferred. A Czech artist, Alfonso Mucha, made the poster in 1898 for a cigarette rolling paper company. And the public immediately took to thinking that was the letter O, a stylized O. So instead of J Diamond B, they referred to the company as Job and the name stuck. The poster was in the Art Nouveau style, which included a strategy of repeating the brand name throughout the poster to create awareness. What makes it intriguing is that this strategy had not been adopted in marketing at the time. The guest was gifted the poster and hoped that its value would reach $1,000. Surpassing his wish, the painting valued at... And I think that at auction, you'd be looking at between $7,000 and $10,000. Wow. Very nice. This man came with an RAF plane and an airship, and both were toys. The toys were made in the 30s by a German company for the English market. And absolutely indicative of the, the period of which it, in which it was made. On the body of the toys was the mark of the RAF and a registration number. The letters in the registration number and the mark of the marker showed that it was made by Distler, a company that manufactured various kinds of toys. On the basis of value for the toys, the appraiser placed both at... Uh, the aeroplane, if it went into auction, would probably realize between perhaps 500 and 600 pounds. We examine a painting believed to be the work of Edouard Cortez, known for his captivating Parisian street scenes. Edouard Cortez, born in 1882 near Paris, hailed from a family of accomplished artists. Best known for his Parisian street scenes, Cortez dedicated his career to capturing the city's essence. To ascertain the painting's authenticity, the appraiser reveals a unique method used by Cortez, pinpricks. A pinhole discovered on the canvas indicates the artist's hand in crafting the piece. The price is said to be between thirty and fifty thousand dollars. That's absolutely wonderful. Wow. <laughs> a guest brings forth a Nilo humidor with a rich family history dating back to nineteen forty. Nyloke, which is spelled Kalen backwards, was a pottery company based in Benton, Arkansas. They created hand-thrown pieces by swirling different clays together, producing a beautiful array of colors. This piece is not just a decorative item, it's a humidor. The pierced and hollowed lid shows for the insertion of a wet sponge, maintaining moisture inside to preserve its contents. In this particular humidor, you'll notice the vibrant mix of blues, copper red, and ivory, showcasing the craftsmanship of Nyloke. In today's market, a Nyloke humidor like this would likely fetch around four to $600. Acquired through a personal connection, this painting holds a sentimental value for the owner. This captivating piece is by the artist Olin Travis, here is the unique story behind the acquisition of this piece. About six years ago, 
My aunt was dying of cancer, but she invited family members to come through her home and choose whatever they'd like to have. But I was immediately drawn to this painting. Aunt Marge said, the connection between the artist and the family adds a layer of personal significance to this piece. Olin Travis, born and raised in Dallas, Texas, graduated from the Chicago Art Institute School in 1914. Returning to Dallas, he later established an art colony in the Ozarks. This painting, dating back to 1947, reflects a special time in Travis's life when he fell in love. Executed on Masonite, Olin Travis chose the smooth side, showcasing his skills in impasto technique. The provenance of the painting is well documented, and its condition is excellent, housed in its original frame. With an Arkansas subject matter, the estimated value of this painting is about $10,000. I did not expect that. <laughs> Whoa, holy cow. <laughs> that takes my breath away. <laughs> This item takes us to a yard sale find, a painting with a fascinating story. Purchased for a mere $12, this Napoleonic Calvary piece caught the eye of the current owner. The subject matter in this piece is significant. The original Napoleonic Calvary painting is attributed to the French artist Theodore Géricault, a prominent figure in the French Romantic movement during the early 19th century. However, examining the details and structure, the appraiser suggests that this piece might not be an original Jericho, but a modern copy. The question of intent arises. Was this painting created to deceive? As a decorative copy, its value could range from $100 to $200. In the world of garage sales and hidden treasures, our guests stumbled upon an intriguing find an assortment of wooden objects that turned out to be more than just mere curiosities. Acquired for $40, the owner knew little about these historic items. These wooden models are not toys, but teaching aids for geometry, specifically focusing on volume. Invented by Albert Kennedy in the late 19th century, these educational tools were patented in 1883. The cylinder splits open to reveal its inner workings, allowing a hands-on understanding of its volume. The cone unfolds, presenting a tangible lesson in geometric principles. The sphere unveils its intricate star formation, combining education with aesthetics. Despite some missing components, the value would leave you shocked. So your $40 purchase is probably worth, and this is a retail price, okay somewhere in the range of $1,500 to $2,000. Holy smokes, are you kidding me? <laughs> wow. Our guest brings forth a pair of intricately woven Native American baskets. Passed down from the great aunt, these baskets are believed to have originated from the Gila River Reservation in Arizona. The presence of a distinctive start suggests an early Papago origin earning them the colloquial name of Pimago. Crafted with willow and devil's claw, these baskets exhibit meticulous craftsmanship. The older of the two, with butterfly wing motifs, is estimated to date back to 1890 to 1900. The second basket, adorned with a more modern design, likely hails from the 1920s or 1930s. Interestingly, the butterfly wings and distinctive symbols on the older basket marks it as one of the oldest and rarest designs. These baskets, once created for tourists, now hold cultural and artistic value. This basket, I think we're talking a thousand to eleven $1 hundred dollars. Okay. Yeah. And this basket, a retail value, would possibly be around seven hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. Here is an original copy of Playboy magazine's inaugural issue, Volume 1, Number 1, autographed by Hugh Hefner. Acquiring this Playboy edition was a personal triumph for our guest, who now boasts a complete collection spanning from the first issue to the present day. The magazine opens with the iconic 1949 Tom Kelly photograph, Golden Dreams, 
featuring the then-undiscovered Marilyn Monroe. Hugh Hefner recognized the allure of this image and its potential impact on the magazine's trajectory. The pristine condition of this collector's edition is noteworthy, with only minor imperfections on the spine and a slight stain. A photograph captures the moment Hugh Hefner signed this edition at GlamourCon in California. Purchased for $2,000 to complete the collection, this iconic Playboy edition, signed by Hugh Hefner, holds an auction value estimated between four and $5,000. That's great. That's really great. Nice. All right. Thank you. Let's explore the origin and value of a silver centerpiece bowl, delicately adorned with grapevines and vines, thoughtfully stored in a wine cellar. Suggestions point that it might serve as a vessel for fruits or roses a functional and artistic addition to any setting. The expert reveals that this elegant piece hails from the turn of the 20th century, around 1900. The distinctive crescent and crown marks beneath reveals its German origin, while the number of 800 indicates an 80% silver content, a common standard in Germany after 1890. Stylistically aligned with the early 1900s, this centerpiece bowl showcases the grace and sophistication characteristic of the Art Nouveau era. With a careful examination of the silver content and craftsmanship, this German silver centerpiece bowl could fetch a value of about 1,500 pounds or 15,000 krone. <laughs> Our expert encounters a pair of unique porcelain figures, identified as devils, sparking intrigue due to their rare design. The owner acquired them at an auction in Helsinger, Denmark, with no insight as to the values. Despite the absence of visible marks, these porcelain figures are the work of Johann Jakob Candler, a renowned modeler at Miesen. Crafted around 1736, they are believed to be the representations of Hercules. Used to support a centerpiece with heraldic elements and Hercules figures, these porcelain supports were integral to an opulent display. Despite being incomplete and showing signs of damage, these porcelain figures is estimated to range between 30 to 50,000 Swedish crowns, equating to 3,000 to 5,000 pounds. A guest presents two porcelain pieces acquired at an auction in 1981 and linked to J.C. Rogers, an early founder of Wamego, Kansas. The guest recounts how the piece was acquired. The auction was an, from the estate of a daughter of a gentleman by the name of J.C. Rogers. Both items, an urn and a Sevres-style box, were acquired for $475 and $525, respectively. The appraiser scrutinizes the porcelain pieces, highlighting the hand-painted and gilded features. Despite the seemingly authentic marks, both items are replicas, likely crafted in Europe. The marks, indicating Sevres and Ludwigsburg origins, are exposed as fakes. While the pieces are deemed replicas, the appraiser notes their enduring value in the collector's market. And this beautiful urn here, due to the high decorative appeal and high quality, would probably retail easily for between $1,500 and $2,500. Thank you very much. A captivating lithograph featuring the iconic Sutro Baths in San Francisco. Believing it to be a lithograph and associated with the 1906 earthquake, the guest identifies the subject as the historic Sutro Baths, once a grand aquatic attraction that met its demise in the 1960s. Dating back to 1896, the lithograph showcases the expansive Sutro Baths complex, a recreational marvel featuring pools, slides, trapeze, and more. The printing technique involved 12 sheets, intricately assembled to form the large-scale poster. The lithograph exhibits signs of wear, including tears and paper losses, which, while affecting its condition, can be expertly restored. Recognized as an iconic American poster, the Sutro Baths lithograph is deemed rare and valued. So I would say an auction estimate of fifteen dollars to $20,000 would not at all be out of, out of range. Oh, wow, that's great. Thank you. Intrigued by its artistic allure and suspecting its potential as a hood ornament, this cherished bronze hood ornament is by American artist Harriet Frischmuth. She was an esteemed American sculptor from Philadelphia. 
Having studied under August Rodin and Gudzen Borglum, Frischmuth gained prominence for her sculptures, particularly those depicting women in fountains. The featured bronze, signed and dated 1923, is identified as a rare hood ornament. It's deemed exceptionally rare, and its distinctiveness highlighted by its absence from known catalogs. The bronze hood ornament's auction value is between twenty and thirty thousand dollars. Wow! <laughs> wow! That's awesome. Isn't it? <laughs> That's retirement. <laughs> This 1964 Fender Jazzmaster guitar and matching amplifier was purchased in 1964 and served as a companion to the guest. The features of this 1964 Fender Jazzmaster were a custom candy apple red color and matching headstock. Despite some wear, including chips on the body and a missing strap, the guitar presents well. The current market value of the Fender Jazzmaster guitar will be around $6,500 with the amplifier contributing an additional $3,000 to $3,500. Oh, yeah, I, I was tickled to death. I, of course, I wouldn't sell it anyway. I, it's got a lot of memories. The owner shares the story behind an early Hornby clockwork train set purchased with the intention of becoming a cherished childhood toy for their son. This Hornby train set holds historical significance as one of the earliest creations by Frank Hornby, the founder of the iconic Meccano business. While it saw minimal play, the clockwork train set remains remarkably well-preserved, showcasing minimal signs of wear and tear a testament to its durability over the years. Recognizing its role as one of the earliest Hornby clockwork train sets, the appraisal suggests a value between 300 and 400 pounds. Oh, I think it's wonderful as it is. The roadshow was presented with an extraordinary textile, a Navajo chief's blanket. This piece is associated with Kit Carson, an iconic historical figure. It is a Ute first phase Navajo chief's blanket, crafted between 1840 and 1860, recognized as a pinnacle of Navajo weaving. The piece exemplifies pure linear design and remarkable craftsmanship. For fabric this old, it is remarkably in pristine condition. Fine wool and indigo dyes are used in its creation. You would be amazed to know the price of this amazing piece. On a really bad day, this textile would be worth $350,000. On a good day, it's about a half a million dollars. Oh, my God. And you had no I, idea. I, I had no idea. I am just laying on the back of a chair. Subscribe and check other videos on this channel for more exquisite items.